Good morning, everybody. You know you're in trouble when the speaker brings up this much paper. Oh my God, what's she gonna say? <laughs> so I wanna use my um, time at the podium to uh, talk about three things. One of them is victimization. The other is agency. And the third is collective action. The victimization uh, comments are going to be very brief uh, to focus a little bit on who cares about privacy and how much power do we have to protect our own privacy. The agency discussion will get to the heart of the major theme of my talk, which is uh, our personal responsibilities to protect our own informational privacy and especially our own health information privacy and health privacy. And then I want to talk under the rubric of collective action about the Bioethics Commission, which is, I think, a public effort to improve uh, privacy and other uh, health-related values moving forward. So let me start with victimization. So last year, um, I was uh, in a ballroom in a hotel in Baltimore with a group of about this many people, but they were all women, and they were mostly uh, low-income African-American women. And the thing they had in common is that they were all OBGYN patients of a certain doctor who worked for Johns Hopkins University, one of the nation's leading uh, hospitals, of course. The doctor's name was Nikita Levy. Um, these women were uh, angry, humiliated, demoralized, betrayed, disgusted, horrified, because they were victims of what I regard as one of the most shocking and outrageous health privacy violations of recent times. These women discovered um, the hard way that their doctor had a, uh, uh, a secret uh, spying device, which he kept in his pocket, a little a pen, looked like an ink pen, but it was a camera, and he had some hidden cameras also apparently in his office. And he was videotaping his patients. So there you are, a woman laying on the table, feet in the stirrups, and your doctor is uh, making images, recording your private parts. Um, a nurse who worked in the, um, in the, in the uh, facility where Dr. Levy had his offices, began to suspect something was wrong. She called uh, the, the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, security. They came in, and, and Dr. Levy quite quickly admitted that he was doing this. He gave them the equipment. The police later went to his home, and they found a room full of computers because he was uploading these images to uh, to the computers, and it is believed he was sharing it with the world, the world of OBGYN porn aficionados. I don't know for sure about the extent to which that was going on, but, but he had a huge number of servers, computers, et cetera. It looked pretty bad. Um, Dr. Levy was so ashamed uh, of himself that he um, committed suicide. He went into his home after the discovery had been made. He uh, wrapped a plastic bag around his head. He pumped in helium, and he died. He left his wife a note expressing his remorse and telling her that he didn't want to force her to endure the agonies of trial and, and public disclosure. So in any event, uh, th this is, a, in a, to me, a, an exceptional but a telling example of the extent to which health privacy can be not protected. Our healthcare providers um, are people whom we generally trust, and yet they have within their power the ability to turn us into unwitting victims of, of disclosure. And the, the, women who, the women victims were concerned not only about what their doctor, their beloved doctor had done to them, but then they were concerned about what the police were going to do with all this stuff, all these images. They were going to go through and try to identify the women based on voices, complexions, uh, maybe an occasional face. They were imagining the police 
belittling them, making fun of them, making jokes about them as they did their work of investigation. So, so, so this is an extreme example, but I, I wanted to start with it because I think that when we start talking about health privacy and go to data, we forget about the core of health privacy, which is the ability of a person to uh, be free uh, from uh, having their bodies especially the, the private parts of their bodies, exposed to third parties without their knowledge and their consent. That's where it all begins. Data comes later. Um, and so, and, and what I think this doctor didn't do that he should have done was to show adequate respect for privacy, but also just respect, respect for his patients. So who cares about health privacy? I think when you hear that story, you realize that everybody cares, everybody has to care. Who wouldn't care upon learning that their doctor had uh, turned them into porn? Everybody cares, everybody cares. It was um, particularly upsetting to me that Dr. Levy was uh, a black doctor whose patients were black because Again, it shows not only this kind of lack of respect for privacy, lack of respect for other human beings, other women, women undergoing uh, family matters, babies and so forth, having babies and so forth, but when you kind of betray your own kind, for me, that hits especially, especially hard. I think these women, many African Americans flock to African American providers out of a sense that that's where they're gonna find the most cultural understanding and respect and yet this doctor turned the tables on, on them. I was uh, on Sunday night giving keynote address to something called the Alliance of Minority Physicians at University of Pennsylvania. These are the, it was a, an event to honor the new residents, interns, and fellows, the up and coming generation of doctors. And I, I learned in preparing for that event that indeed uh, we have a shortage, shortage of minority doctors and, and yet uh, as we have the Affordable Care Act, et cetera, there'll be more and more people of color looking for those black and Hispanic doctors because like it or not, people do seek same kind of uh, physicians. So again, it hurt me particularly hard to see that a black doctor was abusing his uh, largely black patient population in this way. But, but lots of doctors of all races uh, I've discovered have, have done similar things, but it's, and it's a shocking lack of regard for people's privacy. Um, so you might think, well, gosh, you know, in a world in which your, own, your doctor can, can turn you into porn, in which there's big data, in which there's, you know, HIPAA is not functioning as, as we might like it to, to keep our health records out of the hands of, of strangers, what, what point is there talking about personal responsibility? What agency is left for us in a world in which so much health data can be um, shared and is shared with other people? Um, so I wanna talk a little bit, a bit about this idea of responsibility for your own privacy. Um, but let me, before I do that, uh, talk a little bit about the Bioethics Commission. So uh, each of the past presidents have um, convened a bioethics commission. And President Barack Obama convened his commission with a broader and more practical mandate than most to advise him and his administration on bioethical concerns that emerge from advances in biomedicine and related areas of science and technology. The goal of the commission is to identify and to promote policies and practices that ensure that scientific research, healthcare delivery, and technological innovation are conducted in an ethically responsible manner. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to be appointed by the president as one of the uh, 12 original members of the Bioethics Commission. In order to get that gig, uh, I underwent a rigorous 12-month selection process. Um, it's a, not a, a day job for me, it's a, it's a plus job. Uh, we're unpaid federal employees, and we are uh, wonderfully diverse. I think we are the most diverse bioethics commission that, uh, that Washington's ever seen. We're black, we're white, we're Indian, we're Persian, we're female, we're male, we're 30-something, we're 60-something, we're Southern, we're Western, we're Midwestern, we're Catholic, we're Protestant, we're Jewish, we're philosophers, we're lawyers, we're MBAs, we're federal agency officials, and we're military officers and scientists. And we sit together and we hear from the experts and we advise the president on, again, issues related to biomedicine, technology, and innovation tied to healthcare. 
Our meetings happen several times a year. They've happened uh, here in Washington. They happen in New York, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Boston, San Francisco, and we hope to be moving to other places as well. And we travel so that people all around the country can have an opportunity to hear about bioethics and what we're uh, working on. Um, we've issued several written reports, uh, in fact, eight of them, and I'm extremely proud of these reports. You can get a copy of them by going to bioethics.gov. Um, and what I like about these reports is that they all are uh, thoughtful uh, projects that we work on together. We have a staff in Washington. We have the commission. We, we together work on producing uh, reports, and we've written about um, uh, synthetic biology, research uh, conduct and misconduct, privacy and progress in whole genome sequencing, safeguarding children, pediatric medical countermeasures research. We've written about uh, incidental findings, and most recently we've begun to write about, um, about neuroscience, ethics, and society. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, two of our reports in particular. Uh, this one, Privacy and Progress in Whole Genome Sequencing. Uh, this is an, an entire report about privacy, and it relates to issues of privacy that arise in the context of whole genome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing is occurring in the context of research, it's occurring in the context of clinical medicine, and we believe it's going to be happening more and more as the cost of whole genome sequencing uh, reduces. Plus, there's just a lot of genetic information out there, e even falling short of, of individual people and their families' whole genomes. So this report is about how can we protect privacy at a time when we're generating huge amounts of data about people that, if revealed, can show some very sensitive things about their uh, health futures and their health presence. And we, um, we wrote a report which was very um, um, tricky because we did not want to be uh, anti-research. We want to applaud researchers who are trying to help us find the cure to cancer or Alzheimer's disease and other conditions that aff affect, you know, millions of people every year. Uh, and so we want access by researchers, but we don't want access by researchers that violates this idea we've heard about this morning of choice and, uh, and, and, and volunteerism. So we try to strike a kind of middle ground between saying, look, we have to be very protective of privacy, but we also have to make it possible for people to voluntarily share their genetic information with um, researchers and with um, clinicians. So, so the, our report is, is an attempt to find that middle ground, and I think it does a pretty uh, good job. More recently, uh, we have uh, begun to think about neuroscience, ethics, and society, and there's a whole uh, privacy dimension to this, this project as well. It's not all about privacy, as the genomic uh, report was, but it is about privacy because among the things that we worry about when we start to penetrate the human brain is uh, privacy. So many of you have heard of, the, of the, uh, President Obama's brain initiative. It's an initiative to, um, to uh, uh, look into the ways in which um, neuroscience research uh, can be um, used for human betterment. In uh, July of 2013, just last summer, President Obama charged the commission to consider ethical, societal, and other issues tied to advances in neuroscience. And we very quickly uh, came upon uh, the notion that we needed to include in our work neuroscience uh, and privacy. Um, a variety uh, of neuroimaging technologies like C CT scans, PET scans, EEGs, and fMRIs enable us to see brain activity in different ways. And new insights into the brain can raise questions about privacy, particularly concerning individuals' ability to decide whether and how personal, sensitive, or intimate information is acquired and used. The potential use of neuroimaging techniques for crime pre prevention, lie detection, or to make inferences about criminal intent raises broader concerns about the societal implications of the underlying research. So as we begin to get more skilled at penetrating the brain, we're also penetrating the self, and we're, and we're potentially uh, making it impossible for people to con control their inner thoughts, their feelings, their intentions, their moods, their aspirations, if we think we can bypass the self and go directly into uh, the brain and use images to make these important discoveries. So we are mindful of the Commission about the ethical concerns tied to privacy and other ethical issues tied to neuroscience, 
and are issuing two reports. The first one is already out. I just read you a little bit from it. That's called Gray Matters. Uh, but we'll have a second report out soon that goes more deeply into the issues. Right now, we're just saying make sure that, and I think that Mr. Um, Shaw was, uh, was um, emphasizing this earlier, make sure that early and often in the design of the research, you're including ethical issues, including concerns for privacy. So through our democratic process, we have a president. The president has a bioethics commission. The commission is working to protect your privacy. And uh, that's a collective action part of my, of my talk. The, um, the uh, next phase is really the biggest phase. And I want to talk to you about this very, um, I think, sensitive and complicated question of our obligations to respect uh, our own privacy. So. Um, what should you uh, share with the world? What should you share with the world? Uh, many of you are probably like me, uh, NPR fans. Well, Scott Simon, the popular host of National Public Radio's Weekend Edition Saturday, shared his experience of his mother's death poignantly in real time on Twitter. Literally down to the last dying breath, he's tweeting what's going on. I love Scott Simon. I thought it was odd, actually, that he would um, tweet his mother's death. Standing in his bathroom late one night, 70-year-old Fox News television host Geraldo Rivera proudly tweeted a picture of himself nude, but for a pair of uh, sunglasses and a towel uh, wrapped around his groin. Why did he do that? Why didn't he keep that to himself? He said, I'm so, I'm, I'm just so proud. I look so good for a man of 70. Look at me, you know. Uh, but we didn't need to see that. <laughs> Chiero de Blasio, 19-year-old daughter of New York's um, mayor, posted a four-minute video, I think it was last December, on YouTube explaining that she suffered from depression and substance abuse. So she, she gave away her health privacy to the world. Why? It's not clear. Was it cathartic? Was it a way of inspiring other young people to admit their problems and to get help? Not so sure. But again, she voluntarily gave up her health privacy uh, through a YouTube video. Celebrities and public figures are sharing just about everything with the world, but it's not just them. Ordinary people are sharing, too. Phone calls, texting, Facebook, Foursquare, Instagram, Vine, Tinder, innumerable other social media modalities link us to others and create opportunities for reckless oversharing. Too many to count. Oversharing through devices and web applications is only part of the problem. A Florida man, this has nothing to do with health, but it's an interesting story. A Florida man forfeited $80,000 of, of a court settlement when news of the confidential award ended up on Facebook. How did it end up on Facebook? Well, you know, the man and his wife signed an agreement not to disclose the terms of the settlement with the school district, the school that he'd sued, uh, uh, signed an agreement not to share information. Uh, then he left the settlement, went right to his car, and told his teenage daughter, guess what? We just won $150,000. We're going to Europe, right? And so the young lady immediately goes to Facebook and says, na, 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 na. My daddy won against the school, and I'm going to go to Europe, you know, right? So uh, this, unsurprisingly, got back to the school. Uh, and uh, they decided to try to enforce the, the, um, the uh, settlement agreement. And a judge, in fact, did tell the man, give back $80,000 of the award. So to not being able to keep it to himself and having a child who couldn't keep it to herself, they actually lost something very tangible, money. I am um, very interested in the virtue of reserve. And I'm actually uh, thinking that I'm going to be soon working on a book um, that my agent wants to call Just Keep It to Yourself, uh, <laughs> about the virtue of reserve. Um, and to be reserved is to be uh, one who can exercise the capacity to keep things to oneself, private things and other things. And some people are naturally reserved. And I think that's great. Um, but other people have to make an intentional point of it. They have to try. And I'm particularly interested in people who aren't naturally reserved, who find the moral fortitude to keep things to themselves, to protect their own dignity, to protect uh, other people as well. Deliberate reserve, holding back, keeping quiet, 
is a practical skill and often an ethical requirement. Important categories about which we care uh, and about which we can be reserved are our beliefs, our opinion, information, data, documents, and these can concern our own lives or the lives of other people. Um, you could keep private, for example, the fact that you are a diabetic. I'm a diabetic. No one needs to know that. Uh, that, that someone else is a diabetic, that my, my husband or wife, uh, my husband or wife is a diabetic. Um, or you could have a view about so the politics of diabetes, you might have a view, for example, that, that um, diabetes research is underfunded compared to cancer research. And maybe you, you work for a cancer researcher and you don't want to just blab that out. You have to be reserved about something which may seem rather you know, not private, but yet, given who you are, it may be something about which you need to exercise a degree of reserve. So um, I, I'm exploring, um, and, and I love others thoughts about this, uh, why reserve is sometimes appropriate, why it's a virtue, why we want to encourage it, and how the government and the corporate se sector could join us as partners in our effort to be more ethically, appropriately ethically reserved people. I like to think about, about the idea of partnership. Maybe the laws that we have, maybe the corporate policies that we, that we uh, implement, should be focused also on how can we help people with the challenge of exercising ethical uh, reserve. I had a, um, a personal challenge along these lines uh, uh, very recently. Uh, I was um, diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, I, 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 this is completely true, I sent an email to all of my colleagues at University of Pennsylvania Law School saying, I've got breast cancer. Don't worry, I'm not going to die. But you know, I, I, so, so I told all my students, all my colleagues, pretty, pretty quickly about, this, about, this, about this, uh, this, this, this. And I don't regret that. I think that for me at that moment, sharing my illness felt right. I, I wanted people not to worry. Why did she suddenly disappear from a classroom? You know, is she going to die? We'd had a colleague who had died just a few months earlier of a horrible leukemia. I wanted them to know that I was sick, but I wasn't that sick and I was going to be back. So I sent this email out. And as a privacy <laughs> expert, I, I was but I was sort of reflected about why did I do that and should I have done that and what, was it, was it uh, the, right, the right thing to do? do I, am I going to suffer any negative consequences of that? Um, but, but during my treatment, I realized that while uh, I had shared that much, there was a whole lot more that I wasn't sharing and that I could never share. And in particular, during my uh, treatment, I took a lot of photographs of myself. And, and sometimes I just take these like little selfie headshots. I put on makeup and I'd like pretend I felt really good when I didn't. And I'd smile and I would just you know take these pictures to sort of say, look, okay, I'm I'm okay to myself. But I also took pictures of my surgical wound, and I kind of followed the the healing process. And when I went through radiation, I took pictures of my radiated breasts. If you've ever seen a person who's in week um, six of radiation, it's not pretty. You look like you've, like you've been, bar excuse me, barbecued. Um, so, so I have all these images and I realized that I couldn't share that with anybody. I once suggested to one of my sisters, I have two sisters, do you want to see my pictures? They're like, no, <laughs> we don't. So, so I have this trove of very intimate health-related images that I haven't shown, and I couldn't show to anybody. Not even my closest friends and family want to see those images. So when we start to think about health privacy, when I think about health privacy, I think about there being uh, boundaries, that some health information uh, can, perhaps should be disclosed at your option, and if you disclose it, you're not being a bad person. But there's other health information which I think maybe should not be disclosed. For, my students don't need to see the pictures, even though it might be helpful for them to know the fact. The fact that someone has breast cancer is different from the picture of the radiated breast, right? So, so that, that there's, there's, there's room for boundaries, drawing boundaries, knowing when to be discreet, knowing what to say, knowing what not to say. That's all a part of, I think, being an ethically uh, responsible person. Um, 
Drawing on my expertise in the fields of privacy, data protection, and applied ethics, I'm going to try to make the case for having an ethical responsibility to withhold information that we might otherwise share as acts of discretion and reserve. Some important breaches of this responsibility only affect our own flourishing and dignity, because our lives, but because our lives are intertwined with the lives of others, they can also affect the people around us. Um, when I was working on the privacy and uh, progress in home genome, whole genome sequencing uh, uh, report, I uh, slipped in a line in the report, that draft report, that people have an obligation to protect their own privacy. And we have to uh, be concerned about genetic privacy because people have an obligation to pr pr protect their own genetic privacy. And um, uh, a very astute philosopher on the commission, um, actually my boss, Amy Gutman, said, Anita, that's a controversial proposition to say that people have an obligation to protect their own privacy. And of course, she's right, because in philosophy, there's a live debated question whether people have any obligations at all relating to their own conduct. Because one school of thought says all of our obligations relate to other people. Morality is about how we treat others, not how we treat ourselves. So I found myself having to, uh, before I could even say people have an obligation to protect their health privacy, to go back into the world of Kant and, and other and more contemporary Anglo-American philosophers and make the case that people can have obligations to do any particular things to themselves, to treat themselves with dignity and respect and consideration. And I, I won't go in today in the arguments for that proposition, but I do, do just want to tell you that, that this idea of self-regarding obligations is a rich one, it's a complicated one, it may not sound all that controversial, but it's very controversial among philosophers. And I think one of the reasons why there's so little attention to the idea of what we can do to protect our own privacy is that philosophically, a lot of people just don't even think there's a question there. There's no obligation. There's no there's no room for having a conversation about that kind of issue. But I want you know, to, to argue that, that that's just, just not right. Um, in a non-health context, think about someone like Anthony Weiner, the New York uh, 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 former congressman who uh, tweeted his tidy whities right? So Congressman Weiner tweeted images of his groin to strange women in California and all over the place. He just, he just had a problem. So he was caught and he you know, resigned from Congress. Then he tried to run for mayor, but he, was, he continued to, uh, to, to send out these inappropriate tweets. And I think that New Yorkers finally kind of like got it. This is a man with a problem. And it, you could see it as an ethical problem or as a mental health problem. I prefer to think he's not crazy, but I do think he's ethically challenged. I think he doesn't understand what it means to show respect for your own self, to show dignity, respect to your own uh, life, to keep your intimate life dignified and um, um, uh, appropriate. So reserve can function to protect our privacy. Sometimes we're reserved, uh, and that protects privacy, but sometimes it's the opposite way around where we have privacy in order to enable ourselves to be reserved. Privacy helps us to be reserved, reserved helps us to make, uh, to be more private. And so there are good reasons not to behave like Anthony Weiner. Um, and the reasons include uh, protecting our futures. We're, we're not just who we are right now, but we are, we are we exist over time. We need to attend to the range of activities that give life value, the second reason. We want to avoid harm and self-degradation, another reason. We want to honor commitments, and we want to display appropriate modesties as parents, professionals, to model worthy conceptions of self-respect, respect for others, and flourishing. So um, let me just say a little bit more about some of these. I mean, I, 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 the, the list of reasons why we should protect our own privacy is a long list, and I, I really don't have time today to go through all of them, but I'm just make a couple of comments about some of the, the reasons why we should protect our own privacy. Um, and I, again, I was saying that you know, we're not just who we are today, but we're, we're, we're people who exist over time. So until we're very, very old, uh, and I don't see lots of very, very old people in this room, but until we're very, very, very old, we have to worry about our reputations and preserving opportunities into the future. The you of today matters, but the you of tomorrow matters too. We're works in progress. Um, and I think that young people have seen this a lot. Uh, more than 30% of college admissions officers say they have checked out an applicant on Facebook or the internet. 
Uh, so young people have a reason to be reserved, a practical reason. Despite EEOC laws, employers enga engage in social media background checking to, of their employees. That could lead to discrimination. Uh, research by CMU professor Alessandro Acquisiti shows sadly that job applicants whose social media presence reveals Muslim or gay identities were significantly less likely to get called for a job interview than those who claim to be Christian or straight. So we have these practical reasons to protect our opportunities and to protect our, our reputations into the future. I, and I, again, I don't want to imply that people who are gay should keep that a secret, or people who are Muslim should keep that a secret. My point here is that um, what we say about, our, about ourselves has consequences, and we, if we don't want to embrace the consequences, we have to be careful and exercise reserve. Um, there are basic facts about ourselves that we shouldn't have to hide, but we are, I think, um, needing to be more mindful of what the consequences are of saying even uh, who we um, really are, being our authentic selves. Um, you know, I worry also about, about a lot of flaunting and just sharing information for the sake of sharing, as if there's nothing better to do with our lives. Um, swapping yet another cute cat photo on Facebook cannot you know, compete with writing novels or reading novels or reading films or watching films or listening to music or making music or having sex. Uh, a lot of the, the sharing we do has no, has no sort of self-cultivation feature to it, and I sort of wonder whether people might not spend their time doing uh, quote unquote better things. Um, there's a um, um, healthcare dimension to sharing that I want to uh, to get to uh, before you know before I close, and I I want to use an example to talk about that. Um, there's a woman doctor who um, went on Facebook and she vented about a patient who had not shown up for an appointment. And she was saying, you know, something like, well, uh, she's always late, she, uh, she's late for an induction, uh, blah, blah, blah. And it, it was a kind of discussion that didn't violate HIPAA. It uh, didn't reveal the name of the patient. But it was a troubling uh, kind of lack of reserve in my mind because it showed that the doctor was not as, as respectful and as sensitive to her patient's um, uh, uh, medical privacy as, as she might have been. And uh, what, this, what this doctor ended up facing was an employer who actually felt that she had been um, inappropriate. So this was uh, Dr. Amy Dunbar of Mercy Hospital in St. Louis who wrote freely and with emotion about her frusta frustration about her patient. Um, she didn't disclose again the name of whatever, but she, she just posted this, 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 this message, broke no laws. But here's what the hospital said in response when they learned what she'd done. The hospital said, um, Mercy Hospital values the dignity and privacy of all of our patients, and we're very sorry this incident occurred. While our privacy compliance staff has confirmed that this, pa this physician's comments did not represent a breach of privacy laws, they were inappropriate and not in line with our values of, res of respect and dignity. What the hospital didn't say is that Dr. Dunbar violated an ethical obligation to be reserved in commenting on her clinical work with pregnant patients. A case like Dunbar's underscores the importance of exercising reserve. The world doesn't need to know everything a doctor thinks and feels about her patients. You might even contrast Dr. Dunbar on one end of the spectrum and Dr. Nikita Levy, the, the OBGYN I began with, on another. I think everybody would be clearly outraged by the impropriety that Dr. Nikita Levy uh, committed by you know, recording his, his OBGY patient's private parts. But it's a, another sort of dimension or another extreme as a doctor who doesn't give the patient's name, but just talks in an unflattering way about a patient. But notice how uh, one might view both kinds of conduct as uh, uh, sh not respecting patients, and the, and, the, and, the, and the Dunbar case shows not respecting patients by not exercising the kind of reserve that's appropriate for a medical professional. Um, another example which I've, I've talked about for many years, but I just repeat it now, that, that kind of gets at this other 
end of the spectrum where we're not talking about HIPAA violations or crimes, but about people, about health professionals who are maybe a little bit less sensitive to the dignitarian issues that relate to health care that cause them to overshare. That is the case of the nursing student, uh, Doyle Burns, just from 2010, nursing student at Johnson Community College. She posted a picture on Facebook of herself smiling while holding a freshly expel expelled placenta that she was asked to dissect in her nursing class. And, uh, you know, she was, it was a per in some ways it was a perfectly, you know, benign photograph uh, on Facebook. Uh, and, and she actually t posted it with something kind of colorably permission, permission from her teacher. She and her classmates had a couple of classmates had asked the permission of the nursing school teacher, can we take a picture of ourselves with our placentas? And the teacher said, uh, well, um, okay, but don't, don't include anything that would give away the identity of the patient. And they didn't. Then uh, the teacher later asked him, what are you going to do with these pictures? And the girl said, we're going to post them on Facebook. And the teacher said, oh, you girls, just, just like that, right? And then they did post them on Facebook. And then when the nursing school found out, they expelled the, the girls from nursing school. Now, the, um, the, the, the problem that, that one might see here is an a lapse of professional ethics. You know, it's, it's not a privacy, HIPAA privacy problem, but it's a kind of lack of respect for the patient. Right. Um, and the nursing school believed they, they, were, they were justified in expelling these girls for showing an inappropriate respect for uh, maternity patients. But uh, Doyle Byrne went to court to um, protest her expul expulsion from Community College Nursing School. And she won, and that she won because the judge said that uh, there had been no clear rule in the school that she had violated. Right? So there's this realm of professional ethics, institutional ethics, and personal ethics that can give rise to bad consequences for people who show a lack of reserve, who, who, who overshare. Who, but, but there's also some legal protection if the, if the rules aren't clear enough from you being punished by your employer for, for violations of this realm of personal ethics. Everybody agrees that the guy who takes the videos goes to jail if he doesn't commit suicide. But we're a little bit fuzzier about what should happen to people who are strictly HIPAA violators, haven't committed a crime, but who just show a lack of regard for patient um, ethics. And I, I think that uh, the, the, the conversation that, um, that uh, Deborah Peel's organization has been having for the last uh, 10 years is a conversation that is about health information, privacy, but it's also about patients' rights. And I think that patients' rights include the right to have professionals help them, care for them, who are exemplary in this dimension of reserve, keeping things to themselves that uh, have the potential to, um, uh, to wound, but also that just show a lack of, of, of regard for others and a lack of, of personal, um, personal dis discretion. So why hold anything back? Why keep anything to oneself? Why conceal anything behind walls of privacy? Why, in short, practice reserve? Well, you know, there's an increasingly popular point of view which says, don't hold, don't, don't, don't hold anything back. Uh, it's better to let everything come to light, uh, everything come to light. And this new ethic of disclosure is in strong competition with what I'm trying to argue for today, which is that we should not lead our lives on a public stage. But the competing ethic says lead your life on a public stage. It says that disclosure and transparency are superior values. Disclosure and transparency are superior values to privacy and reserve. For people who hold this point of view, the gains in sociality, security, and markets outstrip any benefit that can be got, any of these dignitarian, uh, the benefits can be got from, uh, from keeping things to oneself. One person put it this way, flourishing happens through recording, networking, and communication, right? Not through keeping things to ourselves, not through. Um, 
but I think that this is a bad, a bad overstated uh, point of view, this idea that everything should come to light. Um, it's, it is tempting, and, it, and it's very hip. I mean, I think that sometimes I, 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 I want to be hip, too. And if, if, if the new thing is, you know, we live in a public stage, uh, everything comes to light. If that's the, 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 the young, youthful, forward-looking point of view, I kind of want to be there in some ways. But in, on the other hand, I don't think that the value of privacy, the value of reserve, the value of confidentiality is lost. I think these are not outmoded, archaic values. There's still a place for those kinds of values in common life. And I want to be part of any movement or any organization that's fighting to preserve our right to privacy, reserve, confidentiality, and uh, the autonomy that they require. So I'm really disturbed by the remarkable extent to which individuals thoughtlessly overlook any obligation to shelter information about their thoughts, feelings, and actions. And such obligations should not be overlooked and, and, uh, when we're talking about, um, about uh, modern life. And I think that you know, technology, we're being told, is causing us to become less inhibited. There's a disinhibition effect to internet life. Uh, we're, we're, we're becoming less concerned about how we look to other people. We just put it out there, let what happens happen, see how many likes we get, and you know, that's, that's the end of the story. But I, again, I do want to suggest that we, we have a, a moral obligation to be somewhat um, uh, inhibited. We don't want the government inhibiting us. We don't want to be like you know, China or uh, Russia in the, in, in the olden days or North Korea today living in a society which demands too much silence of us, too much silence of, of minorities, too much silence of women, fake modesties, closeting. We don't want to live in that world. We want to be able to express ourselves openly. Um, and this is an element of our freedom and of our, of, our, of, our, of, our, of, our, of our autonomy. But at the same time, this kind of freedom that we enjoy, it has responsibilities attached to it, a cliche, but true. With freedom comes responsibilities, and among those responsibilities are the responsibilities to exercise reserve and judgment in how we, uh, how we share information with others. I was um, very uh, uh, amazed that when I uh, you know, began talking about having breast cancer, a number of colleagues said, you should write a book about that, you know? You should write a book about that. Well, 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 what's, well because you know, you're a bioethicist, and it's an interesting story, and blah, 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 blah. And I must say, I had no interest in writing a book sharing the details of my experience with uh, treatment for breast cancer. Um, so I, I, but, but, but there is this sense out there that we ought to be sharing. And I'm going to wrap up here. And I, I just so appreciate the opportunity that uh, Deborah has given me to, um, to, uh, to, to speak today. And I hope that maybe um, I, I have got you a little bit interested in thinking harder about personal obligations to exercise reserve as an aspect of health privacy. Thank you. Were you as blown away as I was yes. by this incredible, incredible woman, Anita? Thank you so, so much. Um, I know you've given me lots, lots to think about, and I just want to point out um, one of the interesting things that, that she talked about was the connection between trauma and exposing things. Uh, you know, when people are hit hard with something, they may not have the judgment to be reserved. There are a lot of people who, uh, I, I just have to get into this, a lot of the things that you're making me think about are, of course, child development. Freud was actually the first child developmentalist. I'm a Freudian. And, you know, and many of the people that I've treated throughout my career have had problems with these boundaries and do things to hurt themselves, such as exposure, or hurt others. And a lot of this does originate early in life with how, you, how you're treated, so there's a whole psychological side of this too that's, that's really important and, and helping people to no longer hurt themselves, <laughs> no longer do things that are destructive to their futures and lives is, you know, that's the, the famous thing that mental health professionals do, you know, uh, uh, fear of success and fear of failure. People do things to themselves that harm themselves. But the connection with trauma, I think, is really important. And whenever we see people exposing things like uh, Anthony Weiner, um, we do begin to wonder what, you know, something is going on there. But people don't naturally do things to hurt themselves or hurt others. I, I really 
again, as, a, as an analyst, I think a lot of this has to do with the development of your personality and, you know, and how you were treated when you're little. So I'm going to stop now, but I just couldn't, I just, uh, this is amazing. Please write more, and all of you, please ask her to come and expand more on these topics. These are so important, you know, because uh, um, respect is so critical to bioethics and also to human health, mental health, and development. And so thank you, thank you. I'm just thrilled with your talk. <laughs> All right, so that was a uh, preview of things to come all day. That was terrific. Um, and, and of course, uh, remember that word choice. And a lot of what Anita referred to was each one of us picking what we do versus other people picking for us what we do um, and that responsibility that comes with it. So that was terrific. Up next, uh, can I go ahead and have the panel uh, come on up? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Nicholas Terry, who's going to be leading a panel for us. Uh, um, multidisciplinary panel from, uh, from policy to uh, legal, et cetera, around privacy, big data, and mobile, and how uh, many, of the, many of the companies in this industry believe that they are uh, basically working outside of HIPAA. What does that mean? Uh, are they really working outside of HIPAA? How much uh, protection does HIPAA actually provide in these uh, cases for big data and mobile technologies? So with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Nicholas and the crew.